So it seems that by far the most popular um, evolutionary biologist is Richard Dawkins, and the school of thought which he really helped to initiate was this neo-Darwinian uh, gene-centric approach to understanding evolution. And the public, I think, uh, understands this project basically as um, resting upon the central idea that genes make organisms. Um, I don't think Dawkins would put it this way. He might, but I think if, if another biologist who had a contrary view pressed him on it, he would admit that um, this isn't just a simplified way of describing a much more complex underlying molecular process. Um, it's actually wrong, or at least misleading. Um, I'm going to... Uh, well, the basic idea is that it's wrong because you need a whole cell with a membrane and all the intracellular matrix and the, the complex activities that go on within it in order for there to be DNA replication at all, or even DNA transcription and translation. Um, you can't have DNA by itself and expect that it contains any information. Uh, it doesn't. The information derived from the uh, DNA molecules uh, comes from the way that the whole cell interacts with them. And so to think of the DNA making the cell and or the multicellular organism is wrong because it's actually, if you're going to simplify it, the cell that makes the DNA. Um, so I'm going to quote from an article by uh, Jesper Hoffmeyer, who uh, is a biosemiotician, uh, and uh, I also quoted the whole thing that I'm reading in the description as well as the link. So here we go. The ordinary textbook talk of DNA as governing cellular or even organismic behavior is rather misleading. In fact, if any entity should be thought of as governor of cellular activity, this should certainly be the membrane. DNA contains the recipes for constructing the one-dimensional amino acid chains which form the backbones of enzymes, and among them the enzymes needed for catalyzing the formation of the constituents of lipid bilayers and assembling them. But whether these recipes are actually read and executed by cellular effectors depends on the membrane-bound activity. All major activities of cells are topologically connected to membranes. In the prokaryotes, like bacteria, the plasma membrane, or the active membrane inside the cell wall, is itself in charge of molecular and ionic transport, biosynthetic translocations of proteins and glycosides, etc., assembly of lipids, communication via receptors, electron transport and coupled phosphorylation, uh, photoreduction, photophosphorylation, and anchoring of the chromosome. In eukaryotic cells, these tasks have been taken over by specific subcellular membrane structures of mitochondria, chloroplasts, uh, the nuclear envelope, the Golgi apparatus, ribosomes, lysosomes, etc. Many, if not all, of these membranes are themselves descendants from once free-living prokaryotic membranes, which perhaps a billion years ago became integrated into the cooperative or symbiotic complex of prokaryotic membranes, which is the eukaryotic cell. Membranes also are the primary organizers of multicellular life. The topological specifications necessary for growth and development of a multicellular organism cannot be derived from the DNA for the good reason that the DNA cannot know where in the organism it is located. Such knowledge has to be furnished through the communicative surfaces of the cells. Morphogenesis is mostly a result of local cell-cell interactions in which signaling molecules from one cell affect neighboring cells. Animal cells, for instance, are constantly exploring their environments by means of little cytoplasmic feelers called philopeda that extend out from the cell. These cytoplasmic extensions that, derive, that drive cell movement and exploration are expressions of the dynamic activity of the cytoskeleton with its microfilaments and microtubules that are constantly forming and collapsing, contracting and expanding under the action of calcium and stress, writes Brian Goodwin. But not only are membranes involved in all the organized activities of the cell uh, of the life sphere, the membrane can actually be seen as the principal locus for life itself. 
It's the membrane that creates the potential inside-outside asymmetry from which the organism-environment asymmetry must have grown out. The origin of life is by necessity also the origin of the environment, and lack of concern for this aspect of the origin problem has seriously hampered much theorizing on prebiotic evolution. Somehow the world became divided into organism and environment, and the formation of a closed membrane must have been part of this process. Here the membrane not only assures the necessary topological closure, but more significantly it takes the role of an interface facilitating a flow of messages between its interior and exterior domains. Considered from the point of view of the membrane, prebiotic evolution is essentially a process of interiorization. Prebiotic membranes colonize the interior space and thereby scaffold themselves through the formation of a multitude of autocatalytic met metabolic loops and finally of replicative molecules mapping constituents of the internal autocatalytic system. Thus persistent architectures appeared as entities engaged in the trick of conjuring up a virtual reality at the inside for the purpose of coping effectively with the outside. On the background of this discussion, it might be fruitful to introduce the term the extended membrane as the inner locus for life. The extended membrane encompasses the totality of membranes that make up an organism, including its skin, plumage, etc., and is responsible for the actual execution of life as a process, semiotic agency. Uh, semiotic just refers to the ability of um, an agent or an organism to interpret signs in its environment. Um, it is the extended membrane that directs ontogeny in a self-organized process scaffolded by an internal system of labels or genes kept orderly in the genome. Um, so in contrast to your view, Gary, what I'm saying and what this article has said uh, is that rather than see DNA as the maker of organisms and the essential component of life, it's actually the membrane that is the essential component. And uh, that if we go back to uh, the origin of life itself to this process of abiogenesis rather than see DNA as being primary um, as coming first we could see uh, and I would suggest we should assume that this is how it occurred that the membrane came first and that within the membrane um, independently of any DNA uh, there were autocatalytic um, processes which is uh, chemical reactions that further their own continued uh, reactions. In other words, A produces B, which produces A, which produces B, and enclosed in a membrane allows it to be distinguished from just the open ocean. And eventually, uh, you know, before even DNA has to come into the picture, we can still have um, reproduction. Uh, because once these, this autocatalytic process grows and the membrane expands, it gets to a point where it needs to break itself off into two other separate membranes um, that both contain the same autocatalytic soup of chemicals uh, that then continue to expand and then they can duplicate. And somewhere along the line, yeah, DNA became implicated in this same process and allowed for the replication to be more complex um, with more fidelity and more complicated structures could be passed on. But um, I'm reversing what you're saying, that DNA came first. I'm saying the self-organization of a membrane-bounded autocatalytic system came first. DNA then came afterwards and um, increased the evolutionary abilities of this original membrane-enclosed system. 